Hey there, students. Happy Valentine's Day. I can't think of anything better to talk about on Valentine's Day than a little bit of romanticism. That is, if we have to talk about European history. This goes out to you, my Valentine, because anyone who watches my videos is my Valentine. So, romanticism. Now, romanticism was a movement that gained steam during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And first and foremost, we have to understand Romanticism as a reaction. Uh, Newton's third law of motion states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. And this applies to human relationships as well. And the Romantic movement is a reaction against the Industrial Revolution. Yuck. Against the Enlightenment. It sucks. Okay, these people would have thrown some darts at Voltaire as much as I love the guy. The Romantics weren't crazy about these Enlightenment values of progress and rationality. So these Romantics are reacting to the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, progress, especially progress as defined by technological advancement and urbanization. So it's a reaction and it's a critique of this Enlightenment worldview that has is caused this filthy, dirty industrial revolution. So let's look quickly at the values of the Romantics. First of all, the Romantics valued nature. A Romantic would much rather look at a waterfall than look at a big, dirty city. And a lot of times we forget uh, to spend time looking at nature and admiring its beauty. Childhood. When we think today about children needing to enjoy being children, we get nostalgic about childhood and we think kids should be kids. This has its root in the Romantic movement. Before this, people thought of children as just little adults that should grow up as fast as possible. But the Romantics viewed childhood as this age of innocence that needs to be enjoyed before they encounter all of the problems of adult life. Emotion. Okay, whether it's crying <laughs> or laughing. <laughs> I don't need a reason to cry, you get it? Reason? These people don't like the Enlightenment that much. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was stupid. But anyway, the other thing is religion. Keep in mind that Voltaire and other philosophes, they favored deism because they didn't like this mystical religion, this religion that was revealed that required faith and all of that kind of stuff. But the Romantics, they like this mystical element. They like something that can't be understood. Why is it that you have to understand everything? Just go into that church and light a candle candle, a pretty candle preferably, smell the beautiful incense, look at the beautiful scenery. Uh, religion is beautiful and Catholicism actually experiences somewhat of a revival during this time because Catholic churches tend to be very pretty and very sensual compared to most Protestant churches. Romantic love. Okay, that's where we usually use this term today. The Romantic movement was a lot bigger than this, but the idea that you should fall in love and marriage should not be about economics, but it should be about love. Uh, this has its root in the Romantic movement. Nostalgia. Any of you that have ever been to medieval times or anything like that or watched a movie about the Middle Ages, whether it be Monty Python or anything else, this nostalgia, this idea that the Middle Ages were cool, this is something that's gaining steam during the Romantic movement. Keep in mind, folks from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment viewed this as a dark age, but now people are writing books about it, people are celebrating at this age of chivalry that happened before the world got so modern. And did I mention nature? <laughs> I think I did, but that's important, okay? Romantics like nature a lot. And especially if you put a castle in the middle of nature and bring in that whole medieval thing, too cool! 
So, let's just take a look at a graphic organizer real quick. You can follow along here. It looks like we've got two columns and five rows um, comparing the Enlightenment and Romanticism. Now, while the Enlightenment is about reason, Romanticism is about passion and emotion. While the Enlightenment emphasizes human nature, Romanticism just emphasizes nature. And while the Enlightenment is about man trying to understand nature and triumph over nature, the Romantics take a step back and they think, wow, let's stand in awe of nature and the power that it has over us. The Enlightenment is forward-looking, emphasizing progress, emphasizing where we're going, what we have to gain. Whereas Romanticism is backward-looking, taking a look back at nature at times gone by and thinking about what we've lost and trying to retain as much of that as possible. While the Enlightenment philosophes weren't crazy about the Middle Ages, Romantics saw that as a great age of chivalry and innocence and all of that jazz. Central to the Romantic movement is the critique of progress. Now you can look at this artwork here and you can see in the distance these smokestacks, these dirty, filthy factories. And then you see at the bottom here this landscape with people and with animals and you can see the beauty of the countryside contrasted with the darkness, the ugliness of this urbanized, factory-ridden, dirty city. And although we're getting our clothes cheaper, although goods and services are being distributed more efficiently than ever. It's ugly. And that's what matters to these romantics. That maybe we should look at progress in a different light than this. If this is where we're going, if this is progress, give me no progress or whatever, regress or whatever you want to call it. Now, there was a lot of literature produced uh, during this time, a lot of romantic poetry, a lot of romantic novels, and a lot of romantic art, which we'll look at. Now, Oliver Goldsmith wrote a poem called The Deserted Village, which is a pastoral poem, a poem that glorifies rural life. And it has a lot of romantic themes and emphasizes the depopulation of the English countryside. A lot of people are flocking to cities, but they're leaving the countryside alone. And so we've got a before and after here. Let's look at how things were before. Sweet Auburn, loveliest village of the plain, where health and plenty cheered the laboring swain. Dear lovely bowers of innocence and ease, seats of my youth, when every sport could please. And yes, that is where Auburn University gets its name. Uh, they call Auburn the loveliest village on the plain. Any of you who are Auburn fans out there, War Eagle. And note innocence and ease. Of course, Goldsmith is kind of minimizing the perils of agricultural life. I'm sure that if you would have asked those people who'd worked on those little farms before this, they probably wouldn't have thought, oh yeah, my life is a life of innocence and ease, sleeping in this straw hut with the pigs and whatnot for warmth. Okay, But looking back, it's easy to be nostalgic about this. So that's how things were before. Now let's take a look at the after. The man of wealth and pride takes up a space that many poor supplied. His seat where solitary sports are seen. Indignant spurns the cottage from the green. Around the world each needful product flies for all the luxuries the world supplies. While thus the land adorned for pleasure all in barren splendor feebly waits the fall. The man of wealth and pride, this rich member of the gentry who now dominates the countryside, 
after the enclosure movement and all of the poor are running off to these dirty, filthy, factory-ridden cities. And we have lost something beautiful. Why? Because of luxury. Around the world, each needful product flies for all the luxuries the world supplies. Now, yes, we have multiple pair of underwear and all of those things that would have been beyond the wildest dreams of someone living before the Industrial Revolution, but it has come at a price. Look at what we've lost. And this is really the essence of the romantic critique of the Industrial Revolution. And another critique comes in the form of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which shares some of these romantic elements. This idea that Dr. Frankenstein, a man of science, set out to do God's work, set out to create a man. This idea that science can solve everything. I can create the perfect man. That humanity through science can do anything. But according to the Romantics, some things are best left up to God. Some things should be left in the dark and should be mystical. And it's okay that we don't understand everything. And in fact, when we take science too far, it can end in disaster. Another famous romantic writer was William Blake, who was also a romantic painter, but wrote several poems known chiefly for the songs of innocence, songs of experience. Some of you might have read The Tiger, T-Y-G-E-R. Why he spells it that way, I have no idea. But I'm going to share a poem with you called, most popularly, by Jerusalem. Now, of course, like all of this poetry at the time, it was titled by just its first line, but a lot of people refer to this poem as Jerusalem. Now, let me give you a little background. This is rooted in a legend that young Jesus Christ went on a journey with Joseph of Arimathea to Britain. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, this is the guy that makes a really quick appearance in the Bible. Jesus is dead. They need somewhere to put his body just for a few days, nothing too long. And this guy, Joseph of Arimathea, shows up all of a sudden and says, hey, now this isn't permanent, right? Because I was kind of planning on being buried here one day. But what causes this Joseph of Arimathea to suddenly step up, which leads people to believe, well, he must have been a family friend. And then he's a tin merchant. He must have gotten that money somewhere to build that fancy tomb. So then, well, maybe he took Jesus on a road trip. Maybe that's why we don't know where Jesus was from the time he was a little boy to the time where all of a sudden he shows up and he's teaching people stuff at the age of 30. Well, no wonder nobody could find him because he was out there in England. And what this did for the people of England is it gives them this uh, notion that, hey, Jesus walked around over here. So, take it or leave it, you may believe that or not. There's really no documentary evidence, but then again, does a romantic really need documentary evidence? Do things really need to make sense to a romantic? The answer to both questions is no. Let's read. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains green? The answer is yes, by the way. And was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture seen? Without a doubt. And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? No. And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? These dark satanic mills. This is the ultimate critique of the Industrial Revolution. That these mills are of the devil. Dark satanic mills. It's got such a ring to it, doesn't it? So the Industrial Revolution isn't just unpleasant. It's of the devil. 
Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. Bring me a slew of obsolete weapons that would really probably get me killed if I tried to go against somebody wielding, I don't know, a rifle or something. But yeah, the more obsolete the weapons, the better. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. So this is going to be a fight. This is going to be about rolling back this industrial revolution, not accepting it, but rolling it back and fighting it with severely obsolete weapons. And you can see just this, almost the hopelessness of it all. But these romantics still feel like there is a chance to reclaim what it is that we've lost. If you like what you've heard so far, stay tuned. I've got another lecture on romantic art coming up. Once it's posted, you can click through to it right there. Until then, happy Valentine's Day.